If you love your football in New Zealand, we have two World Cups this year. The FIFA Women's World Cup, which is just going to be an extravaganza when it hits these shores. Not the football ferns, and I hope to be proven wrong, but this team just disappoints me every single time that they take the field. And I was reading some comments from their coach the other day. They got a couple of warm-up matches before the World Cup, and Yitka was saying something like, oh, we proved against Australia that we can compete with the best teams in the world. And I'm just thinking, what? You've been drinking for how long? Really? Come on. The football ferns talk a good game, but every time they turn up at a world tournament, absolutely put the bed. Prove me wrong. Score some goals and win some matches at the very highest level. The men's... FIFA World Cup in Qatar later in the year. Twice the All Whites have qualified. In 1982, if you're you know as long in the tooth as me, the skip should have been knighted. RIP Steve Sumner leading our team over 14 or 15 matches or something. At the time, it was the most matches any team had ever played to get to a 24 team. That's all it was at the time, a 24 team World Cup. And then, of course, that historic night here in Wellington at the Caton. Uh, when Rory scored the goal over Bahrain and we got through to South Africa. So we're trying to do it for the third time. And the man in charge of this, the coach, is Danny Hay. Played professional football for Leeds, Champions uh, League football for Leeds. He has been manager and coach um, of Sacred Heart Football, uh, of New Zealand under-17s, of Eastern Suburbs Championship side, and is now in charge of the All-Whites, the under-23s, the under-20. Welcome to the show, Dan. G'day, Marty. How are you? I'm really good, mate, and I'm really excited about this. As excited as you are, I'm damn sure. 15th of June, 6 a.m. NZT in Qatar. Costa Rica, how good are they? Yeah, they're decent. We've obviously, um, you know, we're trying to turn up every stone to find out as much as we possibly can. Um, we had a fantastic Zoom with John Herdman, the, the head coach of Canada yesterday, who gave us some really good insights into into what they've found. Obviously, they get the opportunity to play against Costa Rica on multiple occasions, so it's usually beneficial. Same with some time with Anthony Hudson, who's the, uh, the assistant coach of the USA now as well. So, look, we're getting some great insights some great intel. Um, we're going to be as prepared as we possibly can be, I know that. Looking at the results, and I know that you have extensively as well, and you mentioned two teams there. The three that have already qualified automatically for Qatar from CONCACAF are Canada, Mexico, the USA. Now, Costa Rica mm-hmm. beat Canada at home 1-0. They beat the USA at home 2-0. And I think the record was something like that the United States had never beaten them in Costa Rica. Those are two really impressive wins, mate. Oh, absolutely. Which shows, you know, there's, there's a reason that they're 31 in the world. Um, and, you know, a lot of people overseas will look at the fact that it's 31 playing 101 and um, probably probably write us off just off, off that fact alone. But I think we know that, um, you know, we're a genuine chance. But look, people can't underestimate this side. They're, um, they're very good. As you say, they've pulled off some, some massive results, um, particularly at the back end of their campaign to put them in the position that they are now. Uh, they're very, very tough at home. So it's actually nice we're taking them to a neutral venue. I want to talk about that, the advantages or not of playing there. Their group and the matches that they had to play, how much tougher was it for them finishing fourth in their group than us winning the Oceania section? Oh, without a shadow of a doubt, I think, you know, most people would accept that, uh, you know, you're getting hardened matches uh, on a regular basis if you're part of just about any other confederation in the world. It's just unfortunate, obviously, that uh, that given the the nature of our qualifying, that it was a one-off tournament. The reality was we, you know, we we did the job that we had to do. But it would be nice to be in the position of a of a of a nation like Costa Rica, where you're testing yourself against world-class sides on a regular basis. So, you know, to get to the position that they are, um, you know, beating some very good sides along the way, they're they you know they're there as as tough competitors for us. Danny Hayes with us, your wise coach. Dan, do you know why we're the only confederation that that was how our World Cup qualifying was mapped out by FIFA? Everyone else gets to play home and away over a period of time, yet we had a qualifying tournament. Mm. Why? Why? Why us? Oh, look, I think that was simply down to um, the restrictions in, in our part of the world that COVID-19 created. Uh, initially, it was meant to be a home and away series, but obviously with some of the island nations, um, you know, really vulnerable to, to COVID and the inability to get in and out of the countries as well was the big part. Uh, they had to play the one-off tournament, which, like I said, wasn't wasn't ideal. But at the end of the day, it's it's allowed us to 
um, play some some other matches in the windows that we probably wouldn't have had uh, the opportunity to do. So in those FIFA windows where we were meant to be assigned home and away games against the Island Nations, you know we got to, we got to test ourselves against some some reasonable teams over in the Middle East. Is there any advantage at all for the All Whites to play this one-off match in Qatar, given that that's where we played our qualifying tournament? Oh, look, I, I, look, I, I think so. We're we're comfortable with that that region, that part of the world. Uh, we spent we spent a huge amount of time there in October, November last year. Then again in in January, and obviously with the qualifiers in March. So. Um, we know the conditions, we know the area well, we know the stadiums. Um, so, it, look, it, to be honest, it feels a little bit like a home away from home. So we feel like we've got uh, a bit of an advantage on that front. Uh, would we have loved to have played here in New Zealand in front of our home fans? Of course. We desperately, desperately want to want to have that opportunity. Uh, under my tenure, that hasn't happened yet. And uh, as, as I hope a lot of people would recognise, we've got a, a young, exciting um, new breed of all whites starting to come through and playing, uh, you know, hopefully an exciting brand of football. So we would have loved to have played in front of our home fans, but that's not the case. So that said, we're we're, we're comfortable going to Doha. We've done the business there before, and and hopefully we'll do it again. Danny, hey, all whites coach is with us. Just on a housekeeping kind of thing. I mean, do you stay in the same hotel, train in the same ground? Do you keep all of those kind of things in place for the team for this particular one-off match? Absolutely, absolutely. So, you know, that was that was a big part of the thing that we tried to achieve even early on. So when Darren Baisley and myself were, were stuck in, in the Middle East, uh, October, November, December last year, uh, we flew over to Qatar and did quite a bit of reconnaissance there, spent a bit of time with FIFA, uh, chose the hotel that we're in uh, for our World Cup hotel, should we make it, but obviously... Um, we've used that for the qualifiers. We're now using it again for the, the IC playoff. Um, so, look, it, it, like I said, it, it genuinely is a little bit of a home away from home. The players are going to be really comfortable going into that environment. Uh, there's going to be nothing new, nothing that's going to shock them. Uh, so we're excited. As far as playing at home go, you say, you know, you'd love to be playing at home. Is there any, is it, is it advantageous in any way? It might be a dumb question, mate, about, you know, that, mm. that, that there's no pressure on our guys, you know, if there was, they were playing at home under that kind of pressure. I mean, you know, I kind of think that, you know, most footballers under your tenure respond to pressure because that's what you teach. You, you, you embrace the pressure. Mm. You love the pressure. Is, mm. you know, mm. you know, playing at home would, you know, because we're not playing at home, does it give us a, an advantage because there's just no, you know, there's, there's, there's no distractions is what I'm saying here from New Zealand. Uh, look, yeah, I think you'll probably look at it from both both lenses. But, um, you know, it would have been nice. Uh, and, and like you say, I think playing here with, with a home crowd behind us and a really parochial home crowd, um, and I think the fans would have really got behind us, uh, would have been nice. And, and I think we've got a, a breed of footballer and their mentality um, as, as professionals because we've got, a, a, you know, a, a vast, vast number of professionals now compared to what we have done in the past. They're all used to um, those sort of acid tests where there's, a, where there's a fair bit of expectation on their shoulder. Yes, they're young and a lot of them are, are, are still learning their trade and, um, you know, we'll have little moments where it's not always going to be all, all, all rosy, but um, I think they would have grasped that chance to play here. That's it again. You know, we're, we're comfortable going over to the Middle East. What really bums me here, mate, is that, you know, if FIFA can't get their act together and we can't play it at a neutral venue, I was thinking Hawaii or LA, and there'd probably be a fair few of us that want to actually catch a plane and go there, mate. I mean, if it's a 12-hour flight to LA, I mean, you put your hands up, New Zealand fans, come on. <laughs> Would you what? I think I think my wife and family would probably be the first one yeah, to join me. Yeah, so. yeah. No, it's um, it's not. It's going to be it's going to be incredibly warm over in Doha. That's you know that's just the reality. I think it's sort of forty plus degrees there at the moment. Uh, we're being told though we are playing in one of the World Cup air conditioned stadiums, and it is obviously a late kickoff, nine nine p.m. over there. So hopefully the conditions aren't going to be a factor. I think it should be nice and cool inside the stadium itself. Well, it's interesting you say that, isn't it? Because one of the criticisms, obviously amongst the many criticisms of Qatar getting this tournament, was the temperatures. You know that that, that the fans, or the, sorry, that the players are going to play, and that the fans in the stadium. So, you know, just just from what you, just from what you've actually seen and experienced there, is it going to be a factor at all, or is the fact that these stadiums enclosed, their air conditioning, is that going to take out that weather aspect from the actual World Cup? 
Yeah, look, from the actual World Cup, well, I was probably one of the one of the naysayers initially, and look, and that's not to take away from some of the issues that have been brought to light recently around human rights and how they've treated some of their workers. But I think, and I genuinely mean this, I think it's going to be probably the greatest World Cup of all time. It's like the it's like Auckland hosting a football World Cup. You've got a city around that size um, hosting all the games. So if you're a, if you're an absolute football fan, a football nut. You can go and watch New Zealand play against Spain and then jump on a train and go and watch Brazil play against Australia or whoever is in that group. Yeah. So it's, it's going to be quite incredible. Whereas, you know, previously, if we think back to South Africa when the All Whites were last there, you couldn't go and watch other games. The, the, the size of the country and the nature of it just meant that that was virtually impossible. You had to stay within your region. So I think I think... The sheer fact that it's going to have that in November, December as well, the conditions as in the temperature is going to be very reasonable. It's not going to be overly warm. And then you've got the added benefit of um, all the seats inside the stadium for spectators being air conditioned and then the, the, the pitch itself as well. So I think it's going to be very comfortable. It's exciting. And that's why we desperately want to be there. Danny Hay, the All Whites coach, is with us. You know, the word I write down is fearless. You seem to have picked a fearless young squad. Is that one of the characteristics that you look in terms of the character of the players that you pick, that you want young men who, 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 who don't have that baggage, who want to get the ball, want to hold the ball, want to play football? Oh, look, without a shadow of a doubt, the, the word that we use is courage. And, you know, we're trying to create uh, a really recognisable identity around this team, um, both on and off the field. Um, so we've got, some, we've got some key values and courage is one of them. And so we, we're constantly checking ourselves and each other around, um, are we displaying courage? Uh, are we earning mana as well? You know, we want to we wanna change the perception of the All Whites, we want to change the game in New Zealand. And the only way we can do that is by showing courage on and off the pitch with A, how we carry ourselves, but B, how we, how we try and play the game. So explain that to, to a non-football fan. What do you actually mean by that in terms of the way that the team plays? You know, look, I think historically, and, and look, having, having played for the All Whites myself on, on multiple occasions, um, you know, the coaches never said it directly to us, but I think there was always um, an acknowledgement that we were, were, were somewhat inferior, that we couldn't play a brand of football that was particularly attack-minded or, or exciting. We, we ended up trying to be a little bit negative, trying to hope that we could nick something on the counter or from a set piece. And I think the one thing that I've tried to do with this young group of players is um, give them the courage to try and be far more attack mind, be far more exciting with the way they can live on the ball, boss a little bit of possession at times, um, be expressive. And I think the, you know, the, the young player that we've started to develop in this country, they're you know, they're taken to that because that's how they've actually been brought up. That's how they've been developed. If we were to ask them to play the way that perhaps, you know, the teams that I played in as an all-white um, were playing, I think we would be we would be failing and failing quite miserably because um, that's not their DNA. The DNA of the young New Zealand footballer now is to be far more uh, possession-based, far more creative, far more attack-minded. They want to play and they want to, they want to play exciting football. Danny, all these players that are playing overseas, how do you find them and how do you keep tabs on them all? Because I know I've spoken to you, know, to you about this, but you know, like there might be 30 or 40 young lads and we know quite a few of them by name. They're ex-sacred boys. They're mates of my kids and stuff like that <laughs> that are playing in the college system. Where do you find them all? And, and you know, as I say, how do you actually keep in touch and keep tabs? Because, I mean, I mean just looking at the, of the logistics of it, I mean, you spend half your week doing this. Yeah, it is. Uh, like, yeah, that's just the nature of um, being an international coach. You're, you're watching a lot of football. So I guess with modern, modern day technology, there's, there's nowhere to hide for the players. Um, we've, got a, we've got a huge database. And then with um, things like Scout and Instat, not to mention, you know, the standards like Spark and, and Sky Sport, I, I basically can watch every football game. Um, that's played around around the world. Oh, so, Diane, mate, my God, shaking her head in the background or something. I used to have a husband, she said to me, once, you know? <laughs> once, once. <laughs> but, that's it, but, but that's just the reality, though, for uh, for for us now, as a, for me as an international football coach, is, is tracking all these players and, and keeping a very open mind around, you know, who's who's performing well and the level of competition that they're obviously operating at. 
Um, it's it's easy, obviously, to track the likes of your your Chris Woods, your your, your Liberato Kakaches, guys that are operating at the very highest level. So it's you know key for me that I'm I'm still looking at somebody like a, a Nico Boxel who's playing for San Diego Loyal in the USL yep. in the states uh, and tracking him. And then we have we have regular zooms um, where we connect as a group, and that's one big thing is, is regular connection. I think that's really important for for the mentality of the players as well. Not just that we're we're doing it for the team, but for them as individuals as well. You've got to remember that a lot of these players are young guys that. Mm-hmm. Um, moved overseas to pursue their dream and at times it's tough and they're isolated and they're without friends and family and so I think these little moments of connection are really quite powerful for, for them as individuals but also massive for us as a group. A couple more questions we'll let you go because I know that you're very, very busy, uh, obviously. Uh, Phoenix and the achievement of coming six. I said earlier, we've got Simon Hill on the program. I know who, you know who he, he, he is uh, mm-hmm. in, a, in, a, in, a, in a few minutes talking about this. Look, you know what? I've, I'm really proud of this side. Three out of four years, they've made the playoffs. I know that they, you know, they're, they're stuck over in Australia and everything else, but they just seem to have knuckled down and got on with it. And more impressive than that was the blip that they had throughout the year in a six and a five against the scoreline, which didn't do their goal difference any good. But they bounced back. They bounced back. And now they've achieved, you know, making the finals again. And here's to them. Yeah, oh, absolutely, and I think the nice thing to, that, I, that I've seen as well is that it's been done with uh, primarily a, a young group of Kiwi players as well. Um, you think of some of the young players that have that have stepped up, like Finn Sermon, um, been given a really good opportunity, and Ufi showed a lot of faith in him, and I think that's been rewarded. But you know, it's it's I think what we're seeing from them is just a, a proper Kiwi mentality. They you know, they do, they've knuckled down in tough circumstances where they've been away from home and it's, it's not that glamorous where they're living. living. Um, and they've had to do it, they've had to certainly do it tough, but they've showed incredible spirit um, and courage to, to get to the point that they're at now. And, and look, the finals, anything can happen. That's probably the beauty of it being a, a, a six-man finals sort of set up now. We all hate Leeds Scum. You're going to get relegated, mate, your old team? Oh, sheesh. I know. <laughs> I know. I know. <laughs> sadly... Listen I, to may, that. I may have been too pessimistic, uh, you know, sort of six weeks, two months ago. I was telling Darren Bays, I said, they're in trouble. He's like, no, they're fine. I said, they're in trouble. And, oh, no. It's it's actually, you know what, because the Leeds fans, and I, I know as a Man U fan, you, 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 you think they're, they're not the most pleasant folk, but they are incredible. And you just need to see when they're in the championship, even League One, how many fans they got along and how they get, how they support their team. I, I just feel sorry if they do get relegated, which is looking likely that, um, you know, that, it, that it's the fans that are going to suffer. They deserve to, to be in the Premier League. They're a big team and, and they're a great bunch of fans as well. Final question then. How big a deal is it that we make the World Cup? How, how big is this in your life? Oh look, I think it's it's obviously huge for for me and the team, but I, but even more than that, we know that it's it's more than just us as a small group. It's massive for the game, and it's massive for the game on on, on multiple lengths. Um, I think the the I think the goodwill that it brings to the game, the amount of young players that that will enthuse and excite and and get involved in the game. Um, not to mention the the financial windfall, and we all know that New Zealand football um, that is that is one thing that they always struggle with is the money inside the game. Um, so to bring in a significant amount of money, I think will allow us to do some some really positive things. But it also, you know, from the players' perspective, staff and that, it will shine the spotlight on on everybody. And I think some, you know, like we saw with Winston Reid in 2010, there'll be some good stuff come from that if we make it there. Oh, good! Li- damn good luck to you, mate. Thank you so much for your time, as always. Uh, you're a legend, Marty. Good on you, buddy. Thanks, dude. Appreciate that. Danny Hay with us.